Guys, you've heard me talk about Rebecca Walser on my podcast um, regularly, and I'm delighted to say that we have Rebecca Walser herself, a wealth strategist, a tax attorney, best-selling author. You frequently see her on national media, Yahoo Finance, Newsmax, Fox Business, and more. She also does a podcast. And I wanted to invite Rebecca to come on and talk about the economy. Rebecca, welcome. Uh, Delighted to have you on. Um, I want people to start by getting to know you a little better. Uh, So talk about how you tell a little bit about your story and also how you got into this line of work. That's a great story. Well, um, I have a little light bulb that's in a statue on my desk that my employees bought for me just because of the story that really turned me on to money. I was four years old. I was at a Navy uh, brat in the military. My dad was a... um, enlisted um, person and we traveled the world. I was actually born in Japan. I lived all over before my dad really moved to us to Florida when I was almost in high school. And so I had the life of a military brat. Both of my parents really came from money and didn't really know what to do on a, you know, a, a military sa- salary with four kids in a very short time. So we really struggled financially. I remember at four years old, the lights being off. And, you know, I thought I broke the lights. I had to go and say to my mom, the bathroom lights are broke. I think I broke them. And they sat me down to Nash and they explained what bills are and what money is. And if you didn't have enough money to pay the bills, the lights could go out. And I think that that was such an impactful situation at four years of age that I just determined that I was going to figure out this thing called money and bills. And that's what I was going to do with my life. And I did not ever stray from that path. I graduated. I have four degrees. I took every exact amount of credit hours. I did not take one wasted credit hour in any of those four programs because I was laser focused on finance, economics, mathematics. That's my passion. And and I love it. Well, it's funny, Rebecca, your story really resonates with me. And I, I think it has to do with the fact that although I grew up in a middle class family, um, pretty comfortable circumstances, uh, even in India, I came to America with $500 in my pocket. And I, and I knew that if I stayed, that's kind of all I would be, that's all I would have to start with. And so four years of college, I mean, so and I think that and Debbie sometimes jokes with me about this, that there's a little part of me that still has that mentality of extreme scarcity where yes. i remember in fact when on the flight over uh at an airport we had stopped to make a connection i think in frankfurt and i saw a mcdonald's and i realized i cannot afford to eat at mcdonald's oh. so that feeling that i had gosh you know years and years ago a little part of that is still with me and it yes. makes it gives one a psychology that sort of never goes away well i think one interesting thing about that is that is that your background prepared you for the fields of finance let's talk a little bit about how you think about the economy because because if you're projecting or advising people and saying the economy is going to be good or the economy is not going to be good, uh, what factors do you take into account? Is it is it fiscal policy? Is it the Fed and the money supply? Is it events going on around the world? I'd just like people to get a window into your psychology of how you process this kind of information. Yeah. Well, I would have to really break it down at a time period, Dinesh, for people to really understand because we are now at the ending of a time period. It is absolutely clear to me in black and white. The world doesn't really know it yet. Certainly the media in the United States does not promote this yet, but it is uh, being blasted all around the world and certainly in Asia. We are at the ending of the de- of the fiat system. It is coming to an end very, very quickly because of everything that has happened. So if we take that and we'll pause on that for just a second, we just take a normal, let's say we were just a normal market cycle pre- prior to 2008 or even 2002, the dot-com crash. You know, We would look at gross domestic product. We would look at total uh, economy debt to the GDP of a country. And we'd say, okay, this country can survive with this level of debt burden and this amount of tax collection because they're creating this much national product, whether it's services related or goods related or whatever. And we would normally look at it as an overall country equation. And we'd look at the risk of the country and assign a risk factor to the cost of capital, just basic economics, Dinesh. 
But really, things have changed since the turn of the millennia. We had the dot-com crash in 2000 that really rolled people's uh, confidence in the stock market. And then you can see that we kind of got through that but we got to 2008, 2009, and that was the beginning of the end. And we're now at the end of the end. So this has been going on since 2008. And specifically what changed in 2008 was monetary policy, not fiscal policy. Our fiscal policy has really been in the doldrums for for, for decades now. We've really been overspending. We've been building the national debt really in earnest since the 70s. And that really hasn't changed. What did change was monetary policy. In 2008, 2009, we really got out of what we call in America the Great Recession, what the rest of the world calls the Global Financial Crisis, the GFC. We turn to something called MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, uh, which is a Keynesian theory of you can produce and generate as much money as you want as long as you can service that debt with tax collection. And so we went a little bit crazy and we, we, we stimulated our way out of the GFC. And then we got to 2020. And in 2020, we took MMT to an extreme by basically globally, globally, we bet we had about $30 trillion of currency printed and 2020 in the United States, about 10 trillion. And we absorbed that very quickly, which is what led us into massive inflation beginning in 2021, which the Fed discounted as transitory. But then last year, they finally had to be called on the carpet and said, no, this isn't transitory. You've got to deal with it. And that's where you started to see Powell pivot and really strengthen the dollar internally by all of his rate hikes. We had all of those rate hikes last year and he really had no choice, but that is what is actually bringing us to the end that we're, we're getting to now. I, I believe 2023 will be the end, uh, the final nail in the coffin. And, and that is going to be very uncomfortable for us this year. America is going to be, uh, going to go through a hard time. And that's why people need to really prepare and understand that this is different than anything we've ever seen before in the history of time. Let's take a pause, Rebecca. When we come back, let's return to the issue of the fiat that you mentioned earlier and also what we can expect in this rocky, uh, uncertain uh, year of 2023. 